Okay, so my landlord is trying to increase my rent by 25%. So I'm trying to get in touch with him. The problem is, I don't know who I'm supposed to contact. I don't have a number for the person who owns my building. And the middleman, whose name isn't on the lease, just claims he's speaking on behalf of the landlord. I don't have any choice but to write back to this guy and try to negotiate. Okay, well, that didn't work. Two months later, me and my wife are being forced to move out of our home. How did this happen? Well, when our anonymous landlord raised our rent by 25%, they had complete power over the situation. And the whole experience made me want to find out one thing. Why don't tenants have any leverage in negotiating their rent? That's the mystery we're going to unpack today. This is The Classroom for More Perfect Union, and today we're talking about your landlord. Think about leverage like a tug of war between working people and bosses. In a workplace, workers may have much less power than management, but they still have a few ways to add pressure to their bosses. They can collectively bargain with their fellow employees, go on strike, or individually leverage other job offers from competitors. But as a tenant, there's not a lot of obvious leverage to negotiate or push back against what your landlord wants to do. Tenants are getting squeezed. But the reasons why rents are so high aren't what landlords claim they are. We dug into it, and we were shocked by some of the things your landlord could be getting away with. In the process, we talked to some tenants who were going through situations far worse than my own and learned about two bills in New York State that would make the tenant-landlord relationship a little more equal and serve as good models for the rest of the country. When I told my coworkers about my experience, they immediately started pinging me tons of research about rent laws and legal loopholes. So I asked them to help me out on this journey. And the first thing I learned about was the magical world of anonymity. My wife and I were like getting nervous because our two-year lease was coming up. And then we finally got an email. It was from a random guy named Martin Iden. He wasn't my landlord. I've actually never met my landlord. We pay our rent to an LLC that just has our building's address on it. And there was a, a Zelle associated with a Gmail. And then because it was a Gmail, I was able to find one name, which was Eric Weiser. So I have the incorporation registrations for the LLC that you were paying your rent to right here. There's no Eric Weiser anywhere on here. You're, you're, the LLC that you were paying your rent to is owned by some law firm in Manhattan. You look them up, they're the registered agent of thousands of LLCs. Okay, so now I had three names, right? There's Martin, he's the middleman that emailed me initially. This is him right here, the man literally in the middle. I found this video because he and I share something in common. We both make video content. This is just from his YouTube channel. And funny enough, in one of his videos, he's hanging out with this guy. That's Michael, who is a partner at the law firm that Sean just mentioned. That's the second name I have now. But I still know nothing about the third name, Eric, who I've been paying my rent to this whole time. And I'm getting the feeling that that was intentional. But I'm far from the only tenant in this sort of situation. This is Dorca Reynoso, who lives in Inwood, Manhattan. In 2014, I received a rent increase of 100% in one shot. I was just in disbelief, so I reached out to an attorney. He, you know, briefly looked at my lease and he's like, oh, no, you're a market rate, it's a co-op, so you really have no recourse. And, and did you know at that point who your landlord was? Did you have a name? Or? It was hard to find. We actually had to pull the foil for the property in order to find his name because they, they keep burying their names into different um, LLCs. They transfer from one name to another to hide who they are. LLC stands for Limited Liability Company. And the problem is right in, in the name of it, limited liability. People who form LLCs for their businesses have limited liability for what the business does. That means that they're not accountable for when the business screws people over. So that's why you have states like Wyoming and Delaware where so, so, so many companies are, are, are headquartered because they have the laws that give LLCs the fewest regulations and the most rights. New York has buildings like that too, like this one, 199 Lee Avenue, which houses thousands of companies. This all applies to real estate because today nearly one in six rental properties are owned by LLCs. And that matters. LLCs make housing more expensive and worse. There used to at least be a consistent relationship between a human and a human. That's New York State Assembly member Emily Gallagher, a key advocate in the fight for fair housing. But when someone has anonymity to hide behind, they actually feel much more relaxed about not doing things for their tenants. They have a shield and behind that shield, they feel safe. 
I don't think there's ever been like a good old day of housing. There's always been bad landlords and there's always been crappy buildings. But with consolidation, it really becomes a system where buildings are treated like stocks and bonds. They're not seen as housing. They're not seen as places for um, people to have shelter or to build a family. They're seen as things to buy and sell and trade. Landlords claim that people have flooded back to cities. However, other investigative reports show that this just isn't true. The same way inflation is a story about corporate greed, rising rents are also a story of price fixing. Just look at Dorca's building. When a number of her neighbors had to move out because they were facing the same sort of drastic rent increase that she got, well, her landlord did something surprising. He just left all of those apartments empty. Her building has 63 apartments, but only 18 are currently occupied. Each floor, except the ground floor, has six units. On mine, as is the average, there's only two units occupied. The one directly next to me on the right is vacant. When I come in the building at night, if I have to stand here as I open the door, there's always that anxiety. Because the door, it's, it's just open and it's really dark in here at night. Like, you just never know who could be in there and grab you and hurt you. Very creepy to walk around the floor and just knowing that all of these units, they're completely unlocked. These units have been empty, some of them upwards, close to 20 years. If you are so pressed for profit, why leave them vacant? In 2022, New York City landlords warehoused 60,000 rent-stabilized apartments, which just means that they refused to rent them out because they didn't want to flood the market with those normal rent prices. Ultimately, with legal loopholes and deregulation, landlords have a lot of power and they use that power to accumulate more power. Honestly, when we started looking into this, I realized that landlords actually have a lot of solidarity with each other. ProPublica put this report out that landlords, like major landlords across the country, have been using this thing called RealPage, where they're basically price fixing. Like they're able to go in there and an algorithm can show them like how much they could charge based on what other landlords are charging. RealPage is like a third party, but how third party is it if all the landlords are using it and they're all using it to essentially collude on rent increases? Collusion's a good word, that's exactly what it is. So how do you even go about fighting a machine like this? Well, we took a stab at it. We wrote back to them and we cited the 2019 laws, which entitle tenants in New York, if you live there for, like we were for two years, at least 90 days notice. They said that we had cited legal code and they gave us 90 days to get out. No negotiations. They sent us this notice of non-renewal in certified mail and first class mail. They emailed it to us. They also sent a courier, a kid who came and knocked on the door and my wife answered and he served her the papers telling us to get out. That seems like clear retaliation, right? They gave you an illegal amount of notice, you spoke up and they said get out. We were surprised that everyone told us basically like you can't even fight back on retaliation because landlords have this thing that they're not supposed to do but they do do called a tenant blacklist, which means that if you do go up against them, I mean they have all the resources, if you do wind up in eviction court, your name is going to be there forever and now you're blacklisted as a tenant. Dorka faced the pressures of eviction court firsthand when a family member of hers passed away and she fell behind in her rent payments. The fear and the impotence you feel, like when I showed up to court, I was completely alone in this courtroom. When you're there and you know that they have everything on their side and you're nobody, you know what I mean? It's, it's a lot. I think someone from DSA, I can't even remember who put me in contact with the lawyer that was doing pro bono stuff and he's still helping us out and he showed up for me. I cannot begin to tell you the relief. I was clueless when it came to 20 tenants' rights. Despite not having any experience, Dorka took a bold step and started organizing other tenants in the building who were going through similar experiences. People get really scared with these things, so they didn't want to join at first. But um, once we started banding together and the, lo the landlord knew that we were organizing, um, he backed off. Dorka told me that after the pro bono attorney got involved, her landlord backed off of her non-payment case. And after she and her neighbors banded together, he hasn't increased the rent on them in a few years. But it wasn't enough to save her building's community. As I mentioned earlier, there's two bills in New York State that could actually help tenants. One of them is specifically about LLCs. Emily Gallagher is its lead sponsor. 
The LLC Transparency Act is a bill that would require limited liability corporations to file a document that says all of the people who are beneficial owners for that LLC. To have a human that you can target um, with anything from a request to a lawsuit is really critical. So much of our law is based upon uh, interaction with another person. <laughs> My landlord situation is actually pretty different. I'm in the second uh, floor of a house and he lives right below me, so when I have a problem, he actually fixes it. When my pipes leak, like he actually has incentive to fix it because it'll leak into his house. The second bill would provide even more tenant protections. It's called good cause eviction, and it basically does two things for tenants. One, it gives you the right to remain. So that means every year or every two years, your lease, you can renew it. Because right now, a landlord can say, you have to get out of here in 90 days when your lease is up. The other thing it would do, it was put a cap on how much they can raise the rent every year. So that would be like a universal rent stabilization bill. The city used to be full of rent stabilized apartments, but they've slowly been deregulated over the years. There's a few states that have laws about this, like California has one. We did a video a couple months ago about St. Paul, Minnesota, where tenants got a 3% rent increase cap. Like even in New Jersey, literally the state right next to us, they have some form of rent control. The LLC Transparency Act and Good Cause Eviction Bill have both faced tremendous uphill battles against the real estate lobby. And if they pass, there'll be huge wins for tenants. Other states could follow. Tenant movements across the country are mobilizing for change. Housing is more unaffordable than ever, and we need to shift the leverage back to our side. But wait, one last thing. My story's not over yet. After a number of back and forths with my landlord's middlemen, I was eventually forced to move out of my home of two years. I know that I'm among the luckier tenants in this sort of story. My wife and I have a dual income home with stability and savings, and even for us it was a huge waste of time, money, and resources. We're still unpacking. But a few weeks after we moved, we did get a message. Eric, the guy who we had been paying our rent to, but wasn't on any of the property documents, emailed us for the first time in our entire tenancy. He wrote to us to let us know that he wasn't going to give us back our full security deposit, even though we left the place spotless. Well, at least I finally know who my landlord is, or was. All I had to do was get kicked out. But we want to know, are you facing a rent increase? Are you trying to find out who your landlord is? Well, we included some links to tenor resources in the description below. Thank you for watching The Classroom. We're always looking to tell more stories like this one, unpacking economic systems that impact all of our daily lives. We got into this story because of my experience, but what's going on in your life that we should be digging into? Sound off in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe.